In a world where tomorrow's blockbusters reign, three millennials look back on our generation's classics, on our generation's classics, our generation's classics, and remember. Hey everyone, welcome to Millennials the Movie House, the podcast where three friends watch our generation's beloved movies of yesterday and review them from our modern adult perspective. I'm Betsy. I'm Tracy. And we have no Serena this week. <laughs> she is. I was still be- waiting for that like delayed response. I know. And I'm Serena. No, <laughs> uh, she is not going to make it this week, but she will be back for the next episode. So today we are going to review Beetlejuice. Woo! Beetlejuice. 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 Oh, he didn't appear. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd let Michael Keaton appear in my room. That's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, 1988, directed by Tim Burton, written a story by Michael McDowell and Larry Wilson, screenplay by Michael McDowell and Warren Skarin, starring Alec Baldwin, Gina Davis, Michael Keaton, Catherine O'Hara, Jeffrey Jones, and Winona Ryder. Quick synopsis. I feel like, is this like a did they know it was an all-star cast or was this before they no, all were I like think this, some of them? I mean, like Alec Baldwin was big at that time. I think Gina Davis was big at that time. Catherine O'Hara was not big on the scene. And Winona Ryder was pretty young, though. She did. I think she was established, but she was still relatively young in her career. Yep. Um, but yeah, now they're all like legendary. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but I was. Oh, Michael Keaton had not done Batman yet. This was pre, I think this was pre Batman. Is it? Double check me on that. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna. <laughs> Let's see. 89. Oh. Yep. Okay. Which was also Tim What Burton. was he in before this, though? Yeah, I was. Or one of them was, at least. Yeah. Uh, he was in Mr. Mom. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Oh, who? Oh, Johnny Dangerously. Yeah, Johnny, that sounds familiar. I don't think I've ever actually seen You know that why though. it sounds familiar? Is because um, I talk about this movie all the time. Yeah, you and do. I've tried multiple times to make you all watch it. And oh, I yeah. can't find it anywhere. Really? Oh, that's well, unfortunate. Not like I can't find it like to stream anywhere. Oh, and that's maybe too and maybe bad. maybe that's making me a liar right now, but I would I would highly I love that movie. Yeah. Hang on. All right. Let's now we're going to fall down the rabbit hole right at the beginning. <laughs> Let me just take a quick gander. See if I can find it anywhere. Because I mean, I like Michael Keaton. I'll watch yeah. him in anything. Yep. Honestly, if I'm remembering my fun facts correctly, mm-hmm. when Tim Burton or whoever did the casting asked Michael Keaton to do this, it's not he was like anywhere. Yeah. Mm. Oh. See? Um, Michael Keaton didn't want to do it. Because he's like, I don't get it, which understandably so. But then somebody was like, think Pee Wee's Herman's Adventure. Yes. And I think did did Tim Burton do that? I think, he did. I think Tim Burton did do a Pee Wee. Yeah. Movie. And then he was like, th- then it clicked to him that it was just kind of that like bizarre humor type, like over the top. Yeah. And he was like, OK, all right, I'm in. So and I, I have to say, I mean. I mean, a lot of it is probably just fictional, but the more and more you hear about the more and more it's like, oh, yeah, he did all of it by improv. And it's, you know, it's completely his he completely made up this character. Yeah, of course, it's not. But yeah, of course he did. Yeah. Um, But that said, I think it is true that it is his favorite role that he's ever done. And I mean, I can't fault him for that. (laughs) I have some issues, actually, with is the Beetlejuice. Yeah. The character. In what ways? All right. Let me preface this with, I don't think I've ever watched this movie all the way through until now. Yeah. Okay. I have watched bits and clips of, mm-hmm. of things when it was maybe on TV Always or on TV, VHS, so probably very maybe, cut up and very cut up. And mm-hmm. like, I remember the funny scenes or the song scenes, mm-hmm. but the plot, like not that there's not that it's like this major plot, yeah. you know, whatever. But, and I remember I thought Beetlejuice was kind of not, not a good guy, but I thought he was like the main character. Oh no, he's a bad and he's guy. he's not, he's a yeah. bad guy. He's a bad guy and, I was and like, he has okay. like 15 minutes of screen time. Yeah, that's he's, it. he's yeah. barely in it. 
And I was I was surprised by that, which I guess, you know, there are some movies where you're like, well, wow, I didn't realize that that was only a minor part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was a sleazeball, like total. Absolutely villainous. You you hate him. I thought you loved to hate him. And he and I wasn't like I know people do love to hate him, but I didn't find him charming at all. I don't know. I I know. I don't think you're supposed to. And okay, the reason that you hate him, but you love what Michael Keaton did with him. Yeah, you think right. that it was, like he nailed that character. He oh yeah, did oh yeah, so well with it. Yeah, but he's such a sleazy character and like you're anxious with him because you yeah. don't trust him so yeah. much. Yeah. But that's the point. That's the point. That, of that oh, you know what? So, and that's fair. And I yeah. actually forgot that that, or didn't even know that that was part of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, speaking of Tracy go. <laughs> All right. Well, um, first off, totally forgot that Alec Baldwin and June Davis were even in this movie. No, let and, the lead characters. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, and they did a brilliant job. Yeah. So we have this, this newly ish married couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I don't know. I feel like they're kind of in their honeymoon phase a little bit, but they weren't on their honeymoon. No, 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 no. So they had bought this old house and they were renovating it and just living the cute little married life. Mm -hmm. And one of the hobbies of Adam is he does miniatures. So they go to the store to go pick up a part that he needs because they, you know, they're cute and want to go together, blah, blah, blah. And you know what I also love? I know this is a wicked tangent and whatever is there's no discussion of who's going to drive, but she's the one that gets in the driver's seat. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Just Well, I think part of it is because she pulls over, he jumps out. That's fair. That's fair. But still, but, I've, anyway. Yeah, no, she was driving. Well, <laughs> yeah. except that she crashed. Yeah. Car, so what what you, what you know. Yeah. <laughs> So spoilers, bet. <laughs> Sorry. They <laughs> crash their car and fall into um, a, a river or something and mm-hmm. die. They don't know this, though. And they go back home and they find a book that says handbook for the recently deceased. Diseased. No, deceased. Yeah. Yeah. Deceased. Yeah. yeah. She he calls it diseased. And it's oh, deceased. Oh, oh. And they basically because they've died, this house now needs to be like for sale and sold. And this very eclectic, eccentric family buys this house. I think it's to avoid the dad from having like a midlife crisis psychotic break. I think this break. is the midlife crisis. Okay. All right. Yeah. I have and, so much to say about them, but keep going. Yes. <laughs> yep. Um, so it's, it's a, a mom, dad, and a step-mom. teenage daughter. It was, yes, a stepmom. And She starts the mom starts. Catherine O'Hara starts changing everything because she's very like artsy and wants everything to look great. And and it is an old farmhouse. And uh, Junis Davis's uh, hobby is wallpapering. So that (laughs) just explains a lot. Um, And so the only so then the ghosts want to they don't want their house to be changed or have people move in. So they try to find a way to get rid of the living people. Meanwhile, the only person who can see them is the young daughter. And it's because she's kind of an odd duck and she can see beyond the normal. I myself am strange and unusual. Yes. Yes. So, um, and then it's just, it's a comedy of errors or whatever to try to get the living people out. But then because they're kind of eccentric, they're like, oh, well, this is the newest thing. This is the newest fad to have ghosts in your house. So we're going to like, you know, have popularity because of it or have Mm -hmm. parties and whatever. So they don't mind the ghosts, but the ghosts want to get rid of them and the ghosts can't. So they go to their last resort, which is uh, a ghoul for hire. Uh, What what does he call himself? It's a, um, Oh, he's a bio exorcist, bio exorcist. There we go. Uh, uh, Which is of course, Beetlejuice. And he comes with a whole bunch of rules, kind of like gremlins. (laughs) Um, uh, And, you know, chaos ensues. Uh, they end up having a nice little friendship between the ghosts and the living family and they get rid of Beetlejuice. I never know. There are so many things that I never noticed about this movie until this most recent one. Like I've seen this movie many times, but it's always been like, you know, on TV, your bits and pieces here and there, like not paying full attention. I was 
fully paying attention to this movie from beginning to end, unedited, uncut for TV, whatever. Mm -hmm. I picked up so much more this time around than I ever have. And one of the things I picked up was at the end of the movie, Charles, who is the living husband slash father, was reading a book at the end that was like um, how it was basically like how to live happily with your ghost or something like that. It was like, it was the opposite of the handbook for the recently deceased. It was like the same publisher. It was, it was clever. It was a That's clever funny. little like addition there. I have to say this movie is very clever. Yes. The, my, I want to say my favorite part of the whole thing is the concept of the afterlife. Yes. And like how you die and how, like, how, like, even just like people who committed suicide become civil servants in, in right. the afterlife. They never I was just that like, before. Yeah. That I was, was like, clever. oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. That's clever. Um, and even like, cause she, so the, the receptionist, when they go to the afterlife, the receptionist like kind of throws a lot of the rules or, of the afterlife or, yeah. to you. And I, I had never paid attention to that before, yep. but it was like, you know, you're going to be, they're going to be stuck in the house for like 125 years or something like that. And you're only allowed three times that you can talk to your, your caseworker and you're using up one of those times right now. And it was just like, I, I had never picked up all of those rules that they clearly yeah. had set in motion for this world building, which is genius. Yep. I, I thought it was, uh, there's so, there's so many things that are it's well thought out clever. in this movie. Yeah. Um, good job. Good synopsis. All right. So you mentioned that you had never seen this all the way through you've only seen bits and pieces what were the parts that were familiar to you the look of beetlejuice just mm. whenever he's like that that like crazy look um which actually sorry not to interrupt you but that's mm. the iconic suit black and white striped suit he's only wearing that at the tail end yeah he's not wearing that for a long time and i i didn't register that but yep um the dancing like scene at the table it's iconic and then uh <laughs> winona at the end when she's dancing yeah but i never really like I don't know. I, I, that was it. That was really, I knew there was ghosts. Mm -hmm. And Oh, basically I remember, um, like the look of some of the ghosts and like the scary faces that they made to like do that. And like the, the prosthetics and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So like the lady was cut in half, um, the squished run over guy. Oh um, yeah. 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 And then like the, the face that they make to scare them and stuff. Um, I will say, I mean, this is, this is quintessential Tim Burton, right? Like yeah. this is the good years with Tim Burton. I will also say that, um, the production designer. So I think he would be the one responsible for a lot of those aesthetics that we loved from this. Mm -hmm. Um, what, cause he also did Edward Scissorhands. His name is Bo Welch. And I think he actually married Catherine O'Hara. They met on set here, here, and they got married. Um, yeah, so he was the production designer. Art direction was Tom Duffield. Set to decoration was Catherine Mann. And costume designer was Aggie Gerard Rogers. I just wanted to shout them out because aesthetically, like, no matter how many times you watch this movie, you're going to pick up something else. And it's just so visually engaging to watch yeah. this movie. I love it. And there were a lot of um, homages to German expressionism. So I'm just going to get a little pretentious right there. And okay. okay that's my PSA. Is that like, is that like the artistic, like the 1930s like the arches and like yes. the, that's exactly yeah. what it is okay. that, that those asymmetrical arches. Yes. Cr crazy okay. angles. And like, even like when they're walking, the hallway was like doing that. Yeah. Um, uh, that was not a, that was a visual reference. I'm sorry, podcasters, <laughs> but <laughs> right. <laughs> Apparently the the who is the friend the art artiste friend that Otho Otho apparently at his funeral they played the Shake Sonora like he I was know. really like I think he was really invested in this movie like it was it became his thing I think it was he his, really loved it yeah I think it was his moment and actually he kind of stole the show I know we yeah, always talk about did. those secondary characters but he was he had some oh, great lines. He yeah. was awesome. And I want to like shout out like his character. We've seen this type of person in other movies. I, I what was that movie? It's like the rich person's friend. It's like oh, the artiste, yes. like the patron. Um. Oh, my God. Carlo. Was it Carlos? Carlo? Carlos? Yeah. Carlos? Um, I know who you're talking about. It was about the the man Godfrey, my man Godfrey, maybe. Yes, it was my man Godfrey. Good call. But we've had a couple movies where we have that like that like friend that kind of is the artiste that either is benefiting or is 
being bankrolled or just yes, like, something he's riding uh, the skirt tails of yeah yeah I never registered that aspect of his character before again until this most recent viewing because he every time he referenced a part of his past he was he was talking about a different occupation so he's that person who just yeah. like flits from job to job yeah. and I never registered that that was the character he was because when I was a kid he was like this like pompous artiste type character and I didn't know that he was actually like a fraud <laughs> like right, you know yeah. not really an artiste <laughs> my the best example of this and this is the only quote I wrote down is I I forget when it was but they were sitting like when they had make, made additions to the house and it was like this outdoor outdoor platform that kind of looked mm-hmm. like the living room mm-hmm. and it was his in design and so it had a wall yeah. two missing walls and it was bizarre and he goes I know as much about the supernatural as I do interior design yes. and I thought that was so yes. funny so because I'm like interior design in this house in this room that has no interior right and right. It, yep that's his that's his character in the nutshell. It was real it, I was like yeah. okay there we go that's yep. that sums him up right there <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So did you, so, um, do you stand by the fact that your favorite part is, um, the, the concept concept of the, of the afterlife? Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. And I, I am in awe about, the, about the fact that there is no underlying property. This is an original script. So that just came up with this. That's crazy to me. Honestly, that's genius. Yeah. Because you just don't see that anymore. If you had, like, I, nowadays, this would have been from a graphic novel. This would have started as a graphic novel. Yes. This would not have started as a movie. Oh, I can see it totally. Like, as a, what's the Escher type type graphic novel, like all black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of trippy and. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. But yeah. So I think they did make a cartoon out of this, didn't they? I've, now I feel like I've seen Winona Ryder's character as a cartoon. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, of course, they made it into a musical that's still going um, Broadway. That's actually pretty new ish. Yeah. But just just the fact that back in the 80s, you could have an original script with a crazy idea like this and a some studio somewhere is like, yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put um, Serena's hat on for a second mm -hmm. and point out the music. Music this is what fantastic. it was Danny Elfman. Of and course I think this Danny was Elfman. of course it's Danny Elfman. And I want to say that this was it was one of the first collabs between Burton and Elfman. And I think they do a lot together. I could be making that up. I think it's like right. Spielberg is to John Williams as. <laughs> right. <laughs> so he's you're absolutely right. He's done Nightmare Before Christmas, Charlie and Chalk Factory, Corpse Right. Like he he does Tim Burton movies, but especially with the opening credits, this particular soundtrack sounded like men in black mostly oh and which he okay. is also, he's which he also, also done men in yep. black. but that was that's like kind of straying but yeah danny elfman i i have to say and i'm not surprised that this is my favorite part now as an adult my favorite part is Catherine o'hara <laughs> oh yeah which it's so funny sorry to cut you off no go for but it but you can see her like this was the beginnings of moira Yes. Yeah. She, she is, oh God, she just nails this role. And I had to do the, I had to play the age game because I'm like, it, I, when I was watching this as a kid, Charles and Delia, who are the, you know, mother, father were a pro- age appropriate to me. And it didn't, I never questioned it. And not that they're not age appropriate, but Catherine O'Hara is 34 in this movie. <laughs> Oh, so, wow. And I think, Char- I think, I think he's, she's supposed to be the trophy wife. I think mm-hmm. he, you know, like the second, obviously she's the second wife, but now I'm looking at, it, I'm like, oh my God, she's so young. And, and now, and of course, you know, as a kid, I thought, you know, she was a full grown adult. Of course she was, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, she was just, she's just genius. The way she, she just goes all in on her characters. And, yes. Yeah. You know, becomes those characters. She is, she's that failed artiste, you know, that like she wants to be famous, but her stuff is crap. And yeah. That said, I actually kind of liked her stuff. Like it, they, they, they fit the aesthetic of what the movie was. Well, yeah, I think that was, yeah. Can I, off of that, can we discuss the mother daughter relationship, the stepmother daughter relationship? Yes. And obviously Lydia, Winona Ryder's character has like, doesn't have really a great relationship with the stepmom 
for obvious reasons or whatever. But I and there are certain parts like towards the end when like she runs over, you do see Catherine O'Hara's character like like worry for her, and care for her, and and is like this is my family. Like it's very much a family unit. It is, and I think it's it's interesting that Lydia is at odds with her because she's just as weird as she is. Like they're both kind of odd. Whereas the dad is very straight laced. And all I can think of is, isn't he in Ferris Bueller? Yes, he is. He's the the principal. He's the principal. Uh, That's all I can see for him. Yeah. So I don't see him being odd. Whereas his wife kind of is. So you would think that her and Lydia would get along really well. But and and in my they don't in my head canon after this movie, they do. But I think a lot of it is that um, Delia is so self-centered and so narcissistic that that's true. She doesn't allow for a relationship to blossom. Um, But yeah, they they're very close to the same kind of weird. Yeah. 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 And we don't have a third person to ask what their favorite part was. What part do we think? Yeah, it was the the music music. Yeah. She would also call out the fashion. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> especially um, Lydia's wedding dress at the end. <laughs> and yep. I need to talk about um, Barbara's dress. <laughs> Barbara. Gina oh, yeah. Yeah. Because that is atrocious. And every time I watch this, I'm like, yep. oh, God, the dress. Her hair, and the white too. white tights and the. Oh, my. Oh, my God. God. Oh yeah. And the, the, um, shoulder pads on the dress. Yeah. Oh yeah. God. It's just so bad. Like Adams, it's, it is what it is. It's it a t-shirt is, yeah, under it's... a flannel. That's fine. Whatever. But just, yeah, <sighs> it's painful. Is that, I mean, it was supposed to be present day. It was supposed to be eighties. Yeah. So I think that goes to show too, when you thought Catherine O'Hara seemed old to you, mm. people in the seventies and eighties, when once they passed 25 Mm -hmm. they were officially old yeah because the clothes they wear the the glasses they did how they did their hair like and i'm like even if they didn't have a house and kids all of a sudden they were like frumpy housewife there was you know what i mean and it was like well and i think that that was they were supposed they were trying to lean into the conservative house not conservative but like yeah frumpy frumpy housewife for barbara um but they were doing it on (sighs) purpose for this but it it, that's how like that's just how reality was yeah yeah I got you when when in reality like honestly half of Delia's wardrobe more than half of Delia's wardrobe totally acceptable nowadays like oh, that yeah. would be like, yeah honestly the, the when she did the she had like um a glove wrapped around her head like a headband that would be that would be such a fashion statement right now <laughs> are you kidding me oh my god <laughs> yep. All right. How is this movie millennial and did it impact our generation as a whole? I don't think this is a millennial movie. Really? Yes. Do you think it's an everybody movie? I think it's an everybody movie. Possibly if you had to put a generation on it, it would be a Gen X movie. And the reason I say that is because when it came out, it was not meant for the age group that we, that millennials are. I'm trying to think when I watched it for the first time. I think I was, was going like, to say my counterpoint to you was it may have not been made for millennials when it was like in theaters, mm-hmm. but because it is one of those movies that you would watch on TBS or something, True. we were, it would be our siblings watching mm-hmm. like our older siblings or our parents watching it. And therefore we would have grown up with this movie. We were the so, syndicated years. We were, we were the, the syndicate. Yeah, we are the like we are. We the are the definition generation. of syndicated. Yeah. Ooh, we should. All right. New generation. podcast idea. <laughs> the syndicated generation. Um, I think you are absolutely correct. Yeah. At some point, um, every millennial has seen this movie. Um, yeah. And it's just it's it's just there. It's just there. And it's one of those movies where my family grew up quoting it. The, the most popular the most popular quote to come out of it for my family is who has more fun than us oh <laughs> i mean you know your mother you know she says that is, a lot. <laughs> if gina davis's character and um catherine o'hara's character had a baby it would be your mother it would be my mother yeah yeah so it it was one of those 
weirdly, it was a family movie where we all enjoyed it. We all were able to kind of watch it. And, oh, Beetlejuice is on. Let's pick that for the movie tonight and whatever. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think, okay, I think you've swayed me. I think it is a it is a millennial movie, but it, it was just a counterpoint. It yeah. was an everybody yeah. movie. It really is. You know, everybody can enjoy this movie. I wonder, I wonder if younger people are watching this movie. I don't know. Um, yes. You know why? why? I think there was a resurgence of this movie when Nightmare Before Christmas came out. And I think that's still a millennial movie. But I feel like, I think. Yeah. Oh, is it really that old? Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Still, no, I thought you were going to say when Stranger Things came out because oh. we had a, a Winona Ryder resurgence. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that is also true. Okay. All three of those things, Stranger <laughs> Things, Beetlejuice, and what did I just say? Oh, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Mm-hmm. You could all go to Newberry Comics or Hot Topic and get all of those things right true, now. And true. I feel like all of the the younger kids, yep. if they're that like strange gothy type kid, yep. I meant that as a compliment. As a compliment, absolutely. This has those always the, been aesthetic strong. That you, yeah, absolutely. You are absolutely correct. It's not it, instead of everybody watching it. Certain people are watching it, but yes. it is still there. It's like definitely. a cult classic type of thing. So if you like this, this, and this, you've seen Beetlejuice. Yeah. And now that it's on Broadway and now that, I mean, I mean, not only has Winona Ryder had a resurgence, Catherine O'Hara has, Michael yes. Keaton has, yep. it's just, yeah, you can't, you can't avoid this movie, whether, whether or not you want to watch it. Do you want to know my millennial fun fact about this movie? Go for it. This is the first DVD that Netflix sent out in 1998. That. Oh my God. That is beautiful. That is, I, I approve. I totally This is approve. back when Netflix was discs sent to you. Yeah. In they the mail. still do that. Side note. They still do that. Don't they? Isn't the, the lure of it is there's a bigger collection. Yes. That's why there was a period, I want to say last year, maybe two years ago, where I was getting DVDs through Netflix because there were so many older movies that I wanted to watch, but they weren't streaming, but you could get them on DVD. So there you I, go. Yeah. 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 That is, that is a good tie in with millennials. All right. Boom. We fixed it. My only fix would be, I like the practical effects, special effects that they had. Mm -hmm. It was kind of campy, but Mm -hmm. I liked it. It worked. And even like the dancing scenes or whatever, the only scene that I was like, I don't like this could have been done a little bit better was when Lydia was flying at the end. Yes, I agree. She all looked like somebody just standing still. She's just standing still and they just raise her up a little bit. Yeah. I'm like, you can Peter Pan that a little bit, right? Like what right. is going on here? Like that, this is what she'd got an A on her math test for yeah. like, or yeah. whatever she got. I was like, that was not that I agree with you. If I was, if I was her, I'd been like, dude, right. A little like, bit better. Come on. Like either like turn me into so, like a, I don't know. It could have been the same effects. Like I'm not saying they need to like make, it was just, you need to put a little bit extra effort in that. No, yeah. No. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. And I feel like that scene is so iconic, or I think that because that's one of the three scenes that I remember ever watching, but it is one of the more popular ones. Of course, the, you know, the dinner scene is the most iconic. Yeah, Um, Yeah. yeah, you're right. I guess that is one of the most iconic. It's funny because we're talking so much about Michael Keaton, who again had 15 minutes on the screen, Mm -hmm. Catherine O'Hara, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Jones, Winona Ryder. Alec Baldwin, Gene Davis were the main characters. And they were, were on the and screen honestly, the most. <laughs> the end. They, I, I love both of them. Oh yeah, I yeah. Th- thought they did a great job. They did I, a good job. Yeah, he he was good too. He was he was not the jerk. He was a good guy. Mm-hmm. Um, both of them, I thought, played off each other really well. I thought they had great chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, I even have a note here that says Alec Baldwin had the Bill Paxton haircut. He did to a point oh where I, I there were certain points where I did like a double check because I was like <laughs> is that Bill Paxton oh my god that's funny that's funny yeah young Alec Baldwin oh man um I was just gonna say oh and I again another thing that I'd never really pegged until this time around um Barbara was saved the day at the end she was the hero at the end oh I'm sorry I meant Bill Pullman oh my god I knew who you meant okay Bill Pullman slash Paxson. Same. Yeah. 
Same Pullman though. Person. But I, <laughs> I actually like Pullman better. He's, but it's also because we were raised on Newsies. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I, it hurt my heart that I said the wrong thing. All right. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> she saved the, the, at the end. She was the one who saved the day. Yes. And I, I never picked that before. She was like, we had a, a female heroine, honestly, in that moment. Yeah. I was okay with that. She also punched the sandworm when they first, the first time they encounter a sandworm. She yeah. It. Yep. She held her own. Yep. In her um, frumpy shoulder padded flower dress. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it, it made me think like, instead of feeling sorry for her, that she was the housewife was that she chose that she wanted to be this she did and, you know what i mean like yeah she, if she wanted to be anything else or do anything else she would have but right. this is what she wanted to do well, and, and they i'm like drive okay. that at home right at the beginning when jane comes over and it's like oh my god i got this off- offer for your house and she's like no this is our house like she is yeah. so excited to be in this house yeah yeah she chose this life yeah 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 yeah, yeah. which makes their characters even great even more great like you're allowed to have main characters who like to build models and like to wallpaper their house and like it's okay yeah (laughs) all right notes roundup what has now become my favorite line and i don't know why but at the tail end of the movie when delia scares charles with the beetlejuice statue and he falls out of his chair and she just goes he likes it (laughs) walks away i loved that moment that was beautiful God. um i have a couple of notes here tim burton he started like before he was a director he started in the art department of guess which cartoon he started on casper oh my god no i don't know the black cauldron oh my god doesn't that make a that little is, bit of sense now? Yes. All yeah. the sense in the world. <laughs> it, that makes that makes the Black Cauldron make more sense. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my Granted, God. I don't know how much control he had. I think he was just like a still a peon or whatever. But like still. that yeah. fits. That totally fits. Yep. More on Tim Burton. He did Pee Wee's Big Adventure in 85, Batman in 89. And this mm-hmm. was in between. Right. This was. This was 88. Yeah. So he- I, I like that he brought Michael Keaton along with him. I almost yeah. feel like I wonder if this was like kind of an audition a little bit for him for Batman. Yeah. Yeah. One last thing about Tim Burton is he made a short Frankenweenie. Uh, yes. I when Frankenweenie came out, I as like the, the most recent one, the actual full movie, it was mm-hmm. a cartoon. And I was just like, OK, this is Tim Burton, like. All right. This is, oh, that's great. Yeah. I was just so like, all right. Over him. I was so over him. And I was like, all right, this is not, you know, and I was like, okay, actually give me a little bit respect for him. I was like, this was an original idea from earlier that you had started as a short and now had, I'm like, okay, you know what? Respect. I apologize (laughs) for my earlier criticism, but good job. Okay. So I have two more comments I'd like to make. Okay. One is Sandworms. (laughs) Sandworms. <laughs> you mean tremors, graboids, or yeah. dune? Um, yeah. Or <laughs> thank you. Just... Is that like is? D- I mean, those aren't a thing, right? Like, God, or is I hope it just not. like a. <laughs> um, when was like, when did tremors come out? Eighty nine. I, I think know. it was. I want to. When did the original dune or? Well, the dune book I think of dune old. came out before. Yeah, I feel but like, like, is it just a now? It's like a science fiction trope that people like. I, I I would love to know, Betsy. Can you please write me the historical development of the sandworm? Sandworm. It, you can include like Star Wars, Dune, Tremors, all so, of the. I I just googled it. All I did was Google Tremors, Beetlejuice, Dune, because those three yeah, things. Uh, yep. And there's a screen rant um article called every sci-fi movie that copied dunes sandworms and why <laughs> so okay. all right so it's been written i just have to go out there and find it and read it yep yeah i just i just find it interesting like there's like a quote somewhere that's like vampires are a bad guy or a, or a monster in every culture and they're like and then of course it goes to like well it's because they're real type of thing you know what i mean mm-hmm. and the same with like 
I think dragons a little bit to some point. They're like they're in a lot of fairy tales and stuff. And it's like, well, why does it persist? And Mm -hmm. Um, fairy to uh, fairies, elves, whatever word you want to put to it, that every single culture has that in their lore. Yeah. 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 So I, I just I think it's funny that, you know. That one's why becoming would, a new one. Why, yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Any other any other notes? I feel like I have I... a last one. Yeah, go Did for you? it. Sorry. No, go um, for it. So usually I think we missed it when we were talking about it. We didn't we you had said that this isn't necessarily a millennial movie because it wasn't made for us. Yeah. So this came out in 88. I was three. Were you born? I yet? was maybe born. <laughs> so the things I was watching, both of which scarred my life, The Land Before Time, of course, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, oh, oh <laughs> of course. So those were that's both of which. Well, maybe not Land Before Time. I shouldn't have been watching uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That was I'm not for like, kids. I'm like 99 percent sure I watched it at your house. Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> All right. I think those are all the notes that I have. I mean, I honestly, I could talk about the set design all day on this movie. I feel like I could too, except that I feel like there are other people that are more educated that have better things to say (laughs) other than, and it was cool. It was like shapes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. Martini shot. Would you recommend this movie? Yeah, I would. It's fun. Yeah, I would. I mean, everyone will get something out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what other movies um, are you, or TV shows have you been watching and would you recommend? I am watching at the moment. I'm watching Bridgerton. Is that how you pronounce it? It is how you pronounce it. Um, I really like it. I don't know why I shouldn't like it. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, it's very popular. It Honestly, it's one of those where it's just not my cup of tea, even though you would think it would be my cup of tea. But I don't object to like, I understand why people like it. You know, so because of you, Bets, I have now read Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility. I'm so proud um, of you. Um, the, uh, Northanger Abbey. Northanger Abbey. Yeah. So I want to say that this is prime Northanger Abbey because I feel like there was a lot more rules to etiquette in Northanger Abbey. Yeah. Yeah. It was um, one of the early ones that she wrote. Which, which out of all of them is my favorite of all mm-hmm. the Austins is my favorite. And then I really, really like the Lady Sherlock series which is kind of just this like twist on the Regency error type. It's, I guess it's a little bit later than that, but it's still that like the woman needs a man to, to provide for her and has to have a dowry and all this kind of stuff. And this has those modern twists that I really like. I was just going to say that you in like the world of you like Re- Regency period with modern twist. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And this is, this is all that. So yep. that's fair. Um, I'm a fan. How about you? I have been watching, and I don't know why, but Call the Midwife. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I've just been like running through it. It's great background. It's, it's, I call it cozy TV. It's just cozy TV. You don't, it's not really complex storylines or anything like that. You get to know the characters and you're just following the characters. So you can kind of jump in and out as you need to without without any super high stakes, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's set in the 50s. um, Well, now they're in the 60s and the seasons I'm watching. Set in East East End. And it's just, it's just cozy TV. It's just good stuff. So I love cozy TV. I don't like cozy books. Oh, same, same. If I'm reading, I need to, my mind needs to be like engaged and active. Yes, it needs to be like, not complicated but like it needs to have some depth to it yeah if i'm spending the time and effort to read yeah it needs to be more than i hate cozy mysteries i hate oh them. god no yeah. and like cozy no. romances or whatever and i was but like you i said, will watch a TV hallmark movie and move. Yeah. all day long absolutely because i don't have to pay attention to it right. all right. like my whole attention span it can just be in the background i can just do other things and have it be a nice little whatever yep. whereas a book i'm like Yep. You require too much of my attention to be exactly. half-assed. That's exactly correct. <laughs> that is, yes, what you said. So are we ready to find out what the next movie is going to be? Ooh, okay. Yeah, I forgot we did this. <laughs> <laughs> you get excited every single time. I do get excited every time. <laughs> oh, the big Lebowski. <laughs> you know what? 
I'm okay with that. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've, I've only, I've tried watching it once. I have seen it once. I have seen it once. I've only tried. It's an elder millennial. It's definitely a hard elder millennial movie. Um, but yeah, I think this will be an interesting one. Okay. Yep. I will be very interested to see what Serena says about this movie. I bet she likes it. I think she's going to like it. Yep. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. If you like what you hear, you can find more great episodes over on our website, www.millennialsofthemoviehouse.com or wherever you find your podcasts. Curious about updates, extras from our episodes, or want to add your two cents about a reviewed movie? We're also on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle for both is at the movie Millies. Check us out and make sure to follow us. So until next time, we're millennials and we'll, and we'll see, see you at the, the movie house. house. <laughs> it worked. It worked. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs>